Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Film Nerd Podcast. I'm Vince, and tonight I have a first-time guest with me. I have Andrew Johnson joining me from all the way out in L.A. Uh, Andrew is a Lansing native. And actually, his brother and I were very good childhood friends. And I, I was going to ask you, I'll talk to you when we're done. I was going to ask you how Nate was doing because we got to talking about movies. I didn't get to ask you how Nate's been doing. I haven't seen Nate in a few years. Uh, so, you know, being friends with Andrew's older brother, I spent a lot of time around Andrew when we were kids growing up. And I haven't seen him in a long time. And we just kind of reconnected because uh, Andrew is actually working in L.A. as a production designer, works in production design. 2018 grad at Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee, where he earned his MFA in film studies and production. Andrew, welcome on, man. How you doing? I'm doing awesome. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's, uh, good to finally talk to you on, on Zoom and not uh, Instagram <laughs> and over text. <laughs> yeah, I know. The messages get a little tedious. I'd rather have, especially for these kinds of conversations. They're a lot more fun in person. Yeah, well, absolutely. in person, in quotes, obviously. We're right, on right. Computers, but making it work. So uh, how's how's life been for you over the last year in L.A.? Obviously, everyone's dealt with a lot of crazy stuff. But uh, for you working in the field that you're in, how have things been in general for you? Um, I was at a production company, the like right at the beginning of COVID um, and then moved back to freelance and. I was so lucky. I never had a break in working, which was just like very that's, lucky, but also not, I was going to say lucky, yeah. but probably exhausting. But I feel like you're probably you probably had it better than a lot of people, I would imagine, especially in your yeah. industry where depending on what you're doing, I feel like you got to be in person for a lot of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. We uh, we actually had neighbors that uh, work in the art department and, and they moved out and, uh, moved back to, they were, they're from around LA, but had moved into a different spot. And, you know, I just, I felt very lucky that we kept working. Um, I work on a small team. There's three of us that usually work together. So. And you guys pretty much maintained, it sounds like constant work for much of the better half of the last year. Yeah, we were, we've been doing a ton of stuff. We've been working nonstop. So, and we also split off and, and do our own things and, and whatnot. So, um, so you're not all, always working together, but pretty often. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, I'd say a good like 60 to 70% of the time we're working together. So, so, and before we get into, cause I do want to ask you kind of some specifics about that stuff. Um, first yeah. I, I want to, as I mentioned before we start recording, I want to pick your brain here a little bit on uh, kind of your experience going to Belmont University and choosing to get involved in film studies and, uh, you know, film school and all that. Um, so before Belmont, what kind of led you down that path or why did you decide that that was what you were going into? Or maybe, I don't know, maybe you didn't know at first. Um, I actually didn't know at first. I, I went to Belmont for music school oh, and okay. yeah, and, and it applied so late that I couldn't audition for the music school. So I was doing like choir and uh, voice lessons and whatnot and then didn't get into the music program. Oh no. Were you just devastated? I was like, I mean, Belmont's like 40 grand a year. I was say, that's a really nice school. It is really good school. Yeah. Expensive. And so I was kind of distraught and I had a friend from Lansing Catholic that- mm -hmm. Uh, went to Belmont with me and he switched into the film program and I was like, okay, cool. So, oh, he, like orig movies. he originally wasn't going to do that either? Yeah, he originally was going to do songwriting. Oh, so and both of you coming from the same place are going to do music and both, he made the switch first and you're like, I'll give it a shot? Yeah, and we were good friends before we went to Belmont, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I, I switched into that program and, and I mean, I just like never looked back uh, because it was just so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> so when you ended up deciding to go to Belmont, you didn't get into the, you didn't end up doing the music program. You switched to film studies before that. Had you always been interested in film already? Like it, it was that something that you already had a passion for or kind of, I, I enjoyed film. I, I, I don't know that I ever even thought about like the production side of film. Um, and so getting into that and like immediately being immersed in like the productions that were going on was like, uh, whoa, this is cool. <laughs> well, and I so, think, I think you and I were talking a little bit before about how I chatted with one of my other buddies who works in LA as a colorist. And like, I talked with mm -hmm. him, I think there's so, and I tell this to everybody, um, that's interested in, in, you know, film as a job. 
um, that industry or people who are skeptical about it, I don't think they understand how huge in terms of job opportunities, variety of job opportunities. I think people get stuck on, you know, they hear movies and they think, you know, celebrities and directors and, and movie stars and producers and, you know, right. all this big studios. But like there's so it's like so much more varied than that. Um, and there's a lot of opportunities that, you know, are completely, I feel like, unknown that people don't even know about. Right, right. Yeah, I, I came out here for an internship in 2016 and was working for um, a comic book company called Skybound. Mm -hmm. And uh, they do like The Walking Dead. They just had a new show come out called Invincible on Amazon. I'm looking um, forward to watching that. I heard really good things. Yeah, so I, I was at Skybound and they were like kind of just starting the writer's room on that. So that was like, it's been like five years really cool. of just work, you know? Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I was there and I wasn't doing too much video stuff. Um, I was here and there, but like, it just kind of got me in the door. Um, I was able to go to Comic-Con, which was That's like cool. the coolest thing ever. Um, and like skip the line into Hall H on the big oh, day, nice. you know, you know, cause Robert <laughs> Kirkman is like, you know, the, you know, big guy, yep. uh, uh, in terms of comic books. So it was, it was super cool. That's awesome. So that internship, that's, was that your, like within your first year of school, first, second year? No, the, well, that would have been, uh, maybe it was 2017. Oh, it was um, late, later in your, your time there. Yeah. I went, I went after my junior year. Okay. And so then I was just, came back for a year. Okay. So I was just going to say, then I guess up to that point, um, since you made that, you went to Belmont with music as, in like the forefront, like that was your initial intention, didn't happen, chose film studies. Did you like early on know, okay, I'm definitely committed, like this is going to be a career or do you thought, did you think it was like, I I'll do this and then maybe I'll end up doing something else. Maybe I'll do something in this, you know, career path. Or was it like, once you made that switch, you're in classes those first couple of years, you're like, oh yeah, I'm all in like. And then I'm sure that internship maybe it kind of affirmed some of those feelings. Um, yeah, it was uh, it was definitely like thank thankfully my parents were like okay yeah we'll uh, you know keep some, because it was a huge switch to film. But once I got into the program, um, we had a new building that was like a hundred million dollar building. We have we had like a Dolby Atmos theater oh with gosh, another yeah. smaller viewing theater. We had, you know, full sound stage, full color correction suites, you know, wow. full uh, I mean it was insane. That, that I wonder how how many schools outside of California have something, especially this far east, have something yeah. like that. And not be well, in it, New York or Chicago. <laughs> Yeah, it um it definitely put us on the map, and we we had plugged one of Chapman's professors, and she okay. might have even been head of the program or head of the producing program at that time. I'm not sure, but she came and headed our program for a couple of years. We had had the program for maybe three years, and then she came in um, with the new building and everything, and put all the new like regulations and whatnot in, and was you know trying to make it into a you know a pristine film school and. Yeah. and I mean, it's it's pretty neat, and they focus so heavily on production that um, when I started to get to your question, it wasn't even like, man, I, maybe I can make the big bucks at this. It was just like you know, you were working just weekend after weekend after weekend on set, yep. and it was just fun. <laughs> yeah, it was just like this is something I could see myself like getting up and doing every day, like and enjoying and looking for. Oh, for doing. sure. Absolutely. And some of those people became, you know, my closest friends um, that are still in Nashville. Some of them have moved out here, but yeah. I keep in touch with a lot of people from from film school. So you did have a lot of people that you went to school out there that ended up going out to L.A. in the program or? I'd say there's there's a there's a good amount. Some people went to New York. Um, some yeah. people went down to Atlanta yeah. um, since that's yeah, pretty close. Pretty, Atlanta's kind of a big hub for movies, too. Yeah, so and some people stayed in Nashville and have been and been doing their thing. Um, Do they have opportunities in Nashville if they st if they stay there and they're doing you know production or something working with movies? It's I know a, it's Nashville a is a huge music city, obviously. So right, they yeah, have they, the kind I, of performing arts, but 
Yeah, yeah. I did a lot of music videos while I was there just mm-hmm. as a production assistant. Um, that makes sense. There's a decent amount of like reality TV. I think HGTV is headed in Knoxville, which is like three okay. or four hours east. Yep. You know, so there's definitely opportunity there. And as the city was growing, um, I came in and the city was still growing. And by the time I left Nashville, I mean, it was insane. You know, just the amount of turnover that had happened and the amount of new housing and, and whatnot. It was it was pretty crazy. Yeah, I bet. I mean, I, I always hear that that's kind of a, you know, it's always been a major city, but right. maybe not in the same vein as like a Miami, Chicago, New York, LA, something like that. But I think it's it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, that seems to be the party destination for all kinds of people now, whether it's spring break or bachelorette and bachelor big, parties. Big bachelor, bachelorette oh, party. I worked at a restaurant downtown and it was, we had dipping pools and oh, bachelor and bachelorette gosh. parties would, during the summer, I mean, it was the wild west. <laughs> I bet, I can't even imagine. Spring breaks and summers, I'm sure, are just insane at a place like that. Oh yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, I, I well, you have you have mostly nice weather. I think isn't the winter. You get some like forties and fifties, right? You get snow in Nashville. Yeah, yeah, bit, we got snow. Bit. We we had a uh, what uh, one year we had a huge ice storm come through, and we got that. like three or four wasn't inches that long of ice. Ago, right? No, no, I maybe I remember that. four years ago. I think I remember not, that because it was kind of a big deal for Nashville. Yeah, it was huge. Like the, I mean, we shut down. It's always funny because uh, Michigan State, you know, never shut down, no, and it was always not, really funny to the, me. The one year that they shut down was when we had that uh, when like all those people lost power for like a week at Christmas. We had that awful ice forever. Um, right. I feel right. like Michigan State maybe one day. I think maybe they might yeah. one day. I want to say we shut down for like almost a week. Really? Just like, because they didn't yeah. have the equipment to clear? Uh, and yeah, salt? and Belmont sits on top of a hill. So, um, like, you know, it was it was pretty crazy. People um, sliding everywhere. Oh, yeah, but, man, it was fun for us. <laughs> fun fun for you as in, like... Fun for uh, all the college kids that oh, yeah. didn't have to go to class for a week and were stuck in their dorms. So, of course, we just bought cases of beer and, and just hung, hung out, out even and though, watched well, movies. <laughs> no, I, I didn't say that because Belmont is a, technically a dry campus, so... Uh, we didn't have any uh, alcohol. On no campus. alcohol. They had they had pop. They had adult adult sodas. No, we didn't have pot either. No, I'm just kidding. We had- <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Holy moly! I'm sure you guys had a great time for that whole week. <laughs> oh it, yeah, it was it was a blast. We yeah, we couldn't go anywhere. We couldn't do anything. So, you know, maybe maybe watch a couple movies, right? Yeah, I think around that time I was watching Lost and Transparent with my roommate. Um, and so we went through i haven't watched either of those i got through like two seasons of what, lost and then what, production uh, picked back up where, what's transparent on it's amazon prime okay that's what i thought i, I i've heard yeah. good things but i've never watched that lost was not something i never got into i don't know that phenomenon i remember always being on people always talking about it but i never got into it i really enjoyed it i just didn't watch the whole thing because like i got through two seasons and then production picked back up and Oh, like yeah, my roommate just kept watching and yeah, I, was I, like, I just I can't it's the same thing with Game of Thrones where like I just oh. don't have the time right now to like sit Commit down and show. watch that yeah. yeah so I know a lot of people over COVID watched Game of Thrones or rewatched it and they were like you gotta do it and I'm like I know I do but I just can't right now <laughs> you don't even have time like you did like one episode like a day or every couple days or something I could try doing that, and then like a week will get chewed up with production, oh, and then I you feel like I've back to it. lost. You know, I feel like I've gotten yeah. lost in what's going on. So I could understand. It's that, always sure. tough. Yeah, TV shows are definitely tough unless they're like easy watches. Yeah, I I know we're getting off track here, but that's okay. I was gonna say for TV shows, I'm like, I am very picky because, like you said, they're so t- time consuming, and I will not, I will not start one if I don't think I'm gonna love it. Cause I don't want to spend yeah. hours and it's not like a movie where like, you know, 90 minutes to maybe a three hour movie. If you're watching something longer, like it's an afternoon, you know, or right, you know, right. less than an afternoon. Whereas a TV show is going to take up weeks, depending on how long it is weeks of your life. And it's like, if I don't like it, 
I don't want to spend weeks on it. So I'm always very right, cautious right. about TV shows. You don't want to get to the end and be like, ah. And be dang, like, wow, I, I just wasted. That? Yeah, I wasted yeah. all that time and I didn't even like it. I could have gotten through like 30 movies. Yeah, I could have, exactly. I, That's my argument is in the meantime, I could be trying to catch up on movies I'm being to watch. Exactly. Well, before we, uh, I do want to, we are going to actually talk about, I uh, don't know if I can call it a movie. We'll kind of talk about that in a little bit here. More of an interesting uh, kind of, visual hybrid of a few different things um i do want to ask you just a couple more questions um so one thing i i, I did want to ask you is uh if you want to just talk about your job a little bit kind of we haven't really talked about like your day-to-day for, you know maybe dumb it down if someone's listening i know my my buddy who's a colorist he basically said you know i tell people if they don't know what the heck that is i go it's like photoshop for movies so um if yeah, you can just talk <laughs> about what you do like day-to-day what's your kind of job uh day in the life of Andrew as a production designer. Oh man, there it's it's like vastly different I, every I project. Oh, and bet. yeah, no, and <laughs> my my job is easier than like a colorist who has to know all the technical aspects. It's not easier, but we you know we get different challenges every yeah, every set. I'm sure it has its own challenges. Absolutely. Man, like last week I was cutting cardboard and painting it for a project, and then like I might be working on flats for a different project that it's it's so different but the main like role that i play um as a designer is like taking whatever ideas are out there for the video movie whatever and um and and kind of bringing them to life and then and then me and my team we try to accomplish the vision Mm -hmm. um it's very hard to explain because we just do we do so many different things yeah (laughs) so and you you obviously you work on music videos and i think you have worked on youtube projects as well right sure sure yeah have you have you broken into any tv shows or small movies or anything Um, independent films or student films or anything like that no not yet but there's stuff in the works um which i think is very exciting the i mean in all honesty I was still working at a restaurant three months before the pandemic started. Oh, wow. So you're like a year into this then. Yeah, which is like hilarious to me because like you you wiggle your way into some rooms that you maybe shouldn't be in. Okay. um, Which which isn't necessarily true because... Um, I think anybody you gotta that start works somewhere in though. Works, I mean, you gotta yeah. you gotta put your strong foot forward or whatever, and you gotta you gotta be bold, yeah. and be confident. Yeah, um, a lot of it's word of mouth, where oh, producers yeah, sure. will just give me a call, and sometimes it's like a Monday, and we're shooting on a Wednesday or a Thursday, yep. and it's like we need to pull everything together oh, for sure. that day. But like the last couple of videos I've been on, um, we had like an entire prep week, which was awesome because then we shot two consecutive videos over like two or three days oh, that's um i nice. get a lot of work but out. yeah yeah probably so lot, probably so, a not much downtime though no no yeah. the, and and when you hit that downtime you're like man i should be doing something <laughs> you know and it, it's just like very funny because you go from working on that shoot i was doing maybe like 14 to 16 hour days Mm -hmm. Um, and then, I mean, there are some that you just like, you fall into these like 20 hour days because you're on set for maybe 12 to 14 hours and then you're either prepping or wrapping and, and, you know, it, you get home and you're like, man, I, uh, woke up, went to work and now I'm going back to sleep for a solid four hours. (laughs) Oh my gosh, man. That's crazy. But would you like, you're probably very tired, but I mean, it sounds, you still sound very passionate about it, even though it's not like you're not like, ugh. like you seem excited and, and enthusiastic about it. So even on those days when you're on low sleep, do you feel like you're like, man, I'm tired, but I'm still like, you know, I'm excited about what I'm working on. Like I'll get oh, sleep eventually. So like I'll get sleep eventually. Probably is the Yeah. Attitude. It's, it's, it's so fun. Yeah. I, you know, like even when you have no sleep, um, you know, craft services is always there with, with a cup of coffee, <laughs> coffee. And, say, got your coffee. Yeah. and, and, you know, and, and that's always the people that are literally running the set because, like the energy is always dependent on craft services and oh, yeah. <laughs> good, good, you know, good food and good drinks and coffee and yeah, whatever you need for sure. Tons and tons of coffee. Cause I'm sure if that's not there, it's probably one of those jobs that goes un unnoticed if it's done poorly or if it's not present, right? If it's, if it's done sure. well, then no one probably talks like, okay, yep, good. We got it. But if it's like, 
man, this sucks. Or like, where is it? Then everyone's probably yeah. upset. <laughs> yeah, no, if, if, especially if, um, you know, like we'll, we'll do like passion projects for people. Yep. Um, and, uh, and usually they're very good about, about crafty and food and whatnot, but man, some of those sets where you're working really hard for either little or no money on these passion projects, you're like, at least man, better be I really wish there was food. coffee. Here. Oh yeah. If there's no, <laughs> yeah. If there's no coffee. Oh man. So I guess, and then I got like two more questions that we can kind yeah. of move into a segue into what, uh, our kind of main topic, uh, in terms of, uh, I, I want to say movie, but it's not really a movie, uh, special we're going to talk about. Um, so what you said, you are freelance. Technically you don't like work for a company. You don't have like, bosses. Yeah, you work with a couple, but you like work closely with a couple people. Do you guys have like your own, like, do you guys call it a company or is it basically you're just you're all independent for hire and then you guys just tend to work together as a team on projects and then separately on your own thing. It's not like you're necessarily part of like some company you form together or anything like that. Right. No. Yeah. We all work independent. You know, we've been talking about kind of fleshing this team out and having a name and, and, and doing all that. Yeah. Um, it is, it is a little bit difficult, you know, um, mainly because I think our team uh, doesn't just do art. So we're also directors and we're writers and whatnot. Oh, okay. And and this is like just our primary source of income and what we're good at. So, yep. you know, if, if one of us were to get a big feature a, as a director or whatnot, you know, um, that would be great. But I would hope that they wouldn't come back to the art department because it is, it's hard work and it's a lot of fun, but man, if you can be directing, I mean, it, it I don't know. It's, it's a game changer. So, and that kind of leads me into one of my last questions here. And I talked about this with uh, my buddy Elliot too, because he, he kind of said something similar. He, he always wanted to write and direct. And then when he got to film school, he always knew he wanted to work on movies. He kind of got into becoming a colorist. He really liked the technical aspect of things, but being a colorist, he has said, is kind of a source of income for him right now. He makes good, steady money. And he has right. said, you know, in the future, you know, if other things come up, different opportunities, he wouldn't shy away. So do you have kind of like some goals for the future? Is this kind of like a long term thing or do you want to kind of branch into some other areas within the field? Yeah, I mean, I would love to be directing. And okay. I think that's like the art department has been the best spot for that, um, mainly because there's a good amount of really good art people, but it's a way smaller batch of people, I think, than, you know, people who are cinematographers out here or yeah. people who, you know, so it's a little bit smaller of a community and we all know each other's teams. Okay. So like we work on music videos and there's other teams that work on music videos and we kind of, you know, each other through space, you know, you don't really work with those other teams, yep. but you know them through space. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think, I think most of our team wants to write and direct. So, you know, if, if the opportunities came up like, heck yeah, that would be so cool. And is that something that you feel with what you're doing currently that opportunities maybe through, you know, meeting someone or working on the right project could eventually lead you um, into doing something like that. Cause like you kind of mentioned, I've always felt, you know, from my, the knowledge that I've gleaned, you know, mostly from talking to people, it just kind of seems like it is kind of who, you know, who you meet. And sometimes it's luck. I feel like you just get lucky meeting the right person, being on the right project, you know? Right. Yeah, no, it is, it is definitely luck, but it's, it's also the, the hard, hours that you put in yeah you can't um, be lazy you can't just do nothing you, it's i feel like right. you gotta also be you know like you constantly finding projects you know putting out good stuff and and you know being a part of good projects but also you know you can't just be an asshole either you got to be a, you know make make relationships with people by being personable and doing right a, right know, good work i mean it's yeah yeah well i grab i grab coffee with a with a comic book artist and and he's he's an artist for Skybound, and that's, so that's like why you can find, make those weird connections back home and stuff. So let me let me see uh, here. Well, it's for Image. Simple plug. Um, oh, but absolutely. anywho, I was I was reading uh, Wolfman. I think I've heard which of a, that. 
Yeah, so I'm like, I'm flipping through the, um, like, letter from the artist or whatever, yeah. and, and I see Michigan, and I'm like, that's weird. So I get his email through different channels at the company or whatever, uh -huh. and or maybe it was like his website or something, and so I just emailed him. And he was like, yeah, I just, I kept drawing and kept drawing and kept drawing. And um, after work would draw and after work would draw. And then finally met Robert Kirkman and, you know, is now a full-time comic book artist. Oh, wow. So you that know, was something that he kind of like, transitioned to later, in, a bit later in life, not necessarily. No, right he away. went to school. He went to Lansing Community and he did two or three years there and then was working as maybe a graphic designer, I want to okay. say. Um, but just, he kept doing it, kept doing it, kept doing it. And then, uh, you know, got his opportunity and he had been working so hard that like he was able to just step up and do it. That's awesome. Um, so that's like always the, the, the work hours that, you know, sometimes I'm like, man, I really just want to go to bed. But like at, in the end it shows in the project, oh, yeah. it shows to the producers on the project, you know, um, cause there's nothing worse than like absolutely failing at your job <laughs> yeah i mean yeah any any profession but i feel like that one i feel like there might be less of less room for error in what you right. know your profession just because i feel like your resume are those projects are like your resume and people want to see good work and i feel like one you know shoddy project or something that just doesn't quite come out the way you want it or you know, maybe it's not even your fault and then it could, you know, turn down. Right. And you could lose a p potential, you know, uh, contact or, you know, opportunity that's, you know, in a little different direction or moving up. So I feel like it is an interesting field in that regard. It's, you know, it's not especially like when you know you're like you do something and it just didn't work out the way you wanted it. And there's 40 to 50 people crowded around these monitors looking at the same thing you're looking at. Yep. saying yikes <laughs> and especially if you're not like in control of that project if you're just a small piece it's not like you can stop everything and say oh we're gonna f you're like that it's in there it's there it's like you just gotta own it and roll with it i feel like you're you yeah know, and on the bigger you're... projects it's it's very difficult to like there's a ton of quick fixes that we do on our day-to-day -day, but sometimes you you bring what you have and if something goes wrong or something happens you know and it's not a quick fix. It's like, ooh, sorry yeah, guys. That'd be um, stressful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what? I'm like creeping into a corner. You know. Uh, <laughs> You're like, yeah, really sorry. Get, I gotta get out of here. <laughs> so yeah. before we kind of get into discussion on again, we're gonna talk about a special, but I do want to ask you about some movie stuff. Um, what? is like the biggest project that you've worked on that, that you can talk about. Obviously if something you're, if you have something bigger that you're working on, they're not allowed to talk about, obviously it, you know, but it's like the uh, biggest thing that you have I, out there that you, uh, you know, that you can talk about. That's uh, like, man, this is like, this is cool that I was a part of this. Yeah. I, I forgot about NDAs like the first month that I was here. Oh, you know, there's, really? a, there's, <laughs> there's a few things that like, well, like I worked on the, um, Justin Bieber docuseries and yep. like nobody knew that he had an album coming out so oh. like that one you keep under wraps because that's a pretty big yep. deal because it was his first one in maybe four or five years and yep. and it's funny when you work with people you just kind of like respect their boundaries because they have teams and people around them all the time and it's like they don't need anybody else to you know screw them over or do anything yeah so um but biggest thing that I've worked on that's got to be up um, there that's pretty cool. That was definitely up of. there. That was like, I uh, I had just come off doing, um, so I'll go back to like a little bit before, um, and I was working on a Walking Dead liquor commercial. And, okay, that's really cool. Yeah, and so so I was working on that with um, the production designer, her name's Francesca, and, and I had then texted her about a music video that she was going to shoot. And I was like, yo, hey, I can help out. And it ended up being like three blocks away. So I was like, oh. heck yeah. It was like the day before. And I was like, oh, no problem. I'll be there. So then we worked on uh, Ashley Graham's Pretty Big Deal, which is like a YouTube podcast series. Yep. Um, and then from there, like it was my Pretty Big Deal was my first big project where it spanned like a week or a week and a half, maybe. And uh, actually, my dad worked on that one. I'll have to find that picture and send it to you. And you can <laughs> just like flash it on there. We, we brought him on for a day. 
um, which is just hilarious. The guy thought he was a Hollywood big shot after that. <laughs> what? He thought your dad was? <laughs> no, my dad thought he was. Oh, so. I thought you were saying the other way around. You said your dad thought he was. you were working with a big Hollywood it, big shot. Okay. No, he thought he was a big Hollywood big shot. Oh, uh, he like, came, okay. They were out visiting and, and they had gone home. Because he came uh, he came back and was like, oh, yeah. I was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And my mom kept saying he eased the term in the biz is what he referred to every time. That's um, hilarious. But, you know, that's uh, that's Terry yeah, for you. He was excited. He was having fun. I, I would imagine. I mean, it's, it's very funny that we like worked on the first big set that I worked on, yep. you know, out in L.A. And um, so from there... You know, like, especially what was, in freelance oh, What would you say the project was again that he came out for? Pretty big deal. Okay. So we oh, were wrapping out of the okay. stage. Yeah, yeah, we were wrapping out of the stage and they needed somebody to help. And I was like, I, my parents were in town. So I was like working the whole time. And I was like, oh man, like my dad will come on. Like, you know, I don't know. He can help out. And also I haven't seen him really since I've been here or since they've been here. And uh, so he came out and we rode around and I mean, his eyes were so big because I was driving around a 16 foot box truck. So it, like, he's like, Oh, you're pretty close to that car. And I'm like, dude, it's fine. Like, it's all good. We, I got it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> like I've done this <laughs> but, before. Yeah. But then, but then, uh, so I got off that set and you know, one thing I, I don't think it's talked about a lot is like when you get off like a big set, especially if you hadn't done one before, but I mean, it still happens. Like I got off this two week set, um, just now and was like, that downtime is killer yep. and so i was taking a nap on the couch and i got a call like can you be in santa clarita in 30 minutes and i was like yeah yeah what's it for and they it's for justin bieber and i was like uh oh. okay cool yeah i'll be there in a second <laughs> yeah like, yep, i'm gone <laughs> you gotta tell me twice um you know and that was like the start of me working with um francesca and then our other guy brad um who's another awesome production designer uh art director uh, we just I don't know. The rest is kind of history. And I was like working um, since then. So that's awesome. So do you do you have any like current big projects or like um, I'm assuming if you have anything current, maybe you probably can't talk about it. But what's uh, was the docuseries? Was that probably the most recent big project that you did? Uh, no, I mean, we did um, we did Machine Gun Kelly's downfall. downfall OK, high. Your, yeah, your dad yeah. was telling me that. That's pretty cool that you got to do that, too. Yeah, that was that was really cool because that was like a solid week of prep and then about a week of shooting um, and then like a day of pickups. But it was intense because we were shooting all over the place and it's so cool. And and uh, Madsen, who directed it with Machine Gun Kelly, you know, they have so many ideas um, and it was just a lot of fun. It was it was so fun. Was that cool? Um, so you got you you get to talk and, and get input from those two guys then when you're working on the set. Yeah. Yeah. So is that you know, pretty cool like, getting to talk with them then? Yeah. I mean, it, it is, it is pretty funny when like people walk on set and if you're like the production designer, like you might be talking to the band, you might be talking to the director, you know? So like this last, these last couple of videos I was on was like a ton of like interacting with, the band and making sure they liked everything and interacting yep. with the director and the uh in the cinematographer and making sure everything was cool yep um so i i don't know it is it is pretty interesting because i'm pretty sure i saw machine gun kelly at either the loft or max bar when i was in high school oh really? so, <laughs> so yeah i you know we talked about that a little bit which was very funny he's like y'all do it differently in east lansing and i was like yeah we do <laughs> he, remember, he remembered east lansing huh it didn't it yeah. hadn't faded from his mind well i mean he's played i think he's played common ground a few, few times and well he might have a little he might bar. have a little sore spot uh in terms of michigan after him and eminem's fallout so maybe there's a little sore spot in the back of his mind <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think he's doing pretty well. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just, I know. I'm just kidding. But uh, that's well. That's awesome, man. And uh, I, I feel like I could talk to you about some of those projects forever. But for the sake of keeping things moving, I don't want to keep you too long. We can transition here um, into I before we talk about this special. So I do. Um, Andrew and I are going to talk about Bo Burnham's Inside, which I, I just before we started, literally just finished it again. I've watched it like five times. Um, uh -huh. I absolutely adore it. I'm very excited. I've been waiting. I told Andrew I've been waiting for an excuse to talk about it with somebody. Um, but I just want to ask you just a couple quick questions about movie related stuff in general. So obviously just talk sure. about your, you know, your experience in film school and kind of your job. But 
How about movies in general? Do you get a lot of time to watch movies? Uh, the last year, I know you said you worked quite a bit, but um, do you have kind of a movie going routine at home or going to the theater or anything like that? Um, yeah, usually like the first day or two after a big set, I'll do like just a movie marathon where I just decompress and watch like three or four movies throughout the day. Um, That's great. I love but, it. Uh, I, I unfortunately have not been to the theater yet since they kind of reopened out here. Um, but I need to, I need, I have like this week kind of off, so I'm going to, I'm definitely going to hit up the theater. I'm, yeah, I'm trying uh, to go next week. I've since last March, the last movie I saw before the pandemic was Invisible Man, which I think was February of last year. Uh-huh. Uh, I saw Tenet twice in August. Once I drove to Indiana, Michigan theaters were shut down, drove to Indiana to go see it. Then I watched it again in September and IMAX when they opened back up. And then I saw Minari in December and Promised Young Woman in January. Oh, nice. that's, that's it. That's all I've been able to see in the theater. Nice. Just a uh, tidbit of information. I don't know if you want to include this. Uh, Promising Young Woman shot, shot at uh, RSI where we shot all the Machine Gun Kelly stuff. And it's like, just like a huge campus that's shut oh, down really? now. Yeah. So, RSI is just like this huge campus that uh, like tons of things film at. And it was just very funny because Promising Young Woman had come out and we had just shot at RSI like not too long before that yeah and it just like it just like makes me laugh when we're at you know there's a restaurant down the street that like gets shot at all the time yeah and, you know just very funny they, i mean that's cool you get to be a part of you know working on a set in an area where a best picture nominee was was filming right right it's cool. yeah it's pretty cool and yeah, uh, with with who we're going to talk about today yeah another interesting um, it's it's funny that we you know brought that up i guess it was just a coincidence because I, yeah, now that you mention it, Bo Burnham is one of the few things he's done in the last five years. Um, so I guess with that, let's we can transition into the special here. Um, so we are going to talk about Bo Burnham's latest special. Um, and we're going to kind of talk about how it's been, you know, blurring the lines, excuse me, between it's, it's really blurred the lines in terms of what you can label it. I, I think this thing has, has very immediately become unlabeled. You just can't really label this thing. Um, it's supposed to be his latest comedy special. I don't even know if I'd call it a comedy. Uh, it's pretty depressing. <laughs> um, if you haven't seen it, spoilers, we're going to talk about it. We're going to get into it. It is on Netflix right now. It's very short. Uh, it's not even 90 minutes uh, when the credits roll. I think if you watch the whole credits, which I, I always sit through the credits, um, and I like sitting through the credits through this one because it had another song playing that's kind of ironic within the context of the whole thing but um it's less than <laughs> the it's... credits being all bo burnham <laughs> well that but like the lyrics of the song um at the end too it, it's the lyrics keep saying um something about is it when is it gonna end or is it gonna end soon i think it's referring obviously to the pandemic but so to introduce the special bo burnham um in 2016, it's kind of a little context for it. I don't, and I don't know, Andrew, I figured we'd get into this. I don't know how familiar you are with, with his work, um, but he did a special in 2016 um, called Make Happy, I believe, yes. And around the time he was touring that work, he started getting panic attacks um, on stage, and it gets addressed quite a few times in the special. But he basically quit stand-up comedy five years ago. Um, and in the meantime, he wrote, directed, produced Eighth Grade um, in 2018, which I thought was a really good kind of indie darling that eight, I think A24 produced and distributed. Um, yeah, I he, love that movie. Yeah, I think it's a really it's probably one of the most like grounded and realistic looks, I think, at that age group I've ever seen in a movie. Like doesn't mm -hmm. pander, doesn't feel cheap. It doesn't feel like adults are writing it like it feel a lot of it feels natural, like I was, and I just had finished teaching eighth grade kids. I did eighth grade for one school year. And I'm like, this is how eighth graders act. I was like, this is perfect. Sure. Um, and so he, in the meantime, worked on that movie. He obviously, we just talked about, he was in Promising Young Woman, which I think that filmed and probably around the same time eighth grade came out in 2018. That role probably, probably something about they that. They probably filmed it, even though it came out in 2020, it probably was filmed in 2018 or 2019. Um, yeah, probably something like that. And so he didn't really do much after 2016 other than a couple small projects outside of doing eighth grade. And it was because he was working on his mental health. He was struggling um, to, to kind of get his depression under control, get panic attacks under control, under control. And supposedly 
right before the pandemic in the end of 2019, early 2020, he was like, he was doing a lot better. And he talks about it in the special. He was like ready to start performing again, start touring live stand up, And then the pandemic hit. And so um, this special he recorded, he wrote, directed, shot it, edited it, made all the music. He did the sound editing. Um, if you watch the credits, it's kind of comical. It's just Bo Burn and Bo Burn. I mean, there's there's a few random things that he got some help with, I think, in post production and distribution, and maybe sure, you, know, you who knows what else. But majority, pretty much, the this special is him, um, and he filmed it in his guest house on his property in L.A. Um, and I don't know about you, Andrew, but I love this project. Um, of the few things I have seen coming out of the pandemic in terms of like movies or tv shows or specials that like are from the pandemic about the pandemic this is by far like the best and the pandemic has never even mentioned he never right. even like literally says anything about it like comes out and says covid covid19 pandemic he never uses any of those words never says it what so yeah, what, did, what I, were your uh, kind of overall thoughts on this uh special i i i really enjoyed it i had to like make myself get through the first like five to ten minutes to realize what the special was about yeah do you know um, anything about it going into it i knew a little bit and a couple of friends had been like yeah i didn't make it through the whole thing and so i was like oh no <sighs> really uh yeah but once you like once you watch the whole thing you're like oh okay but also like the videos at the beginning are supposedly shot probably close to the beginning of the pandemic you know and the progression of the whole thing is pretty cool it's pretty there's a I, lot of things in there that are small touches that i think are just genius visual details that like literally if you don't pay attention you'll miss yeah like it's not some it's not like a typical again you can't even really call this a comedy special i've been reading reviews and kind of analysis of the video project whatever you want to call it and people have called it like a visual journal uh people have called it like some sort of neo theater, some new form of theatrical performance. Um, some people have called it a comedy drama documentary special. Like, cause it is weird how many different forms of visual storytelling and art um, that he combines into this on top of music. Um, and I don't know how familiar you are with Bo Burnham's other two specials. What, that came out in 2013 and then make happy was in 2016 they're both on netflix i don't know if have you seen those andrew i haven't seen either of those okay. which like talking about this special was intriguing to me because i know we had uh talked a little bit about um you know bo burnham being on youtube um and we were both kind of around that age where like yep. youtube was like a really cool thing it was new I remember it was i remember it being like everyone just was like like in I mean people still love it but I remember it coming out and like everyone talking about it because I was like in middle school I was like I don't know because YouTube like really got big in like 2006 which was like the year Bo Burnham blew up he was one of the OG YouTube stars sure. and I think I was yeah, yeah like 13 14 yeah. and he was six, I mean, he's two I years mean, older why, than me. he was 16. why did he why did he wear sweatpants to that party I mean you know like the guy should have known. <laughs> I I love I love those original Bo Burnhams, man. Oh those my are God, so dude, funny. I, I can't believe yeah, that's a reference. I haven't even heard that one in a long time. He's he yeah. had he had probably a dozen like music. They were like music videos. He was just in his like bedroom in his parents' house. Right, right. He's sixteen years old. He's still going to high school. He's just up in his bedroom, and he would say, "Hey, you guys want to hear a song?" And then he would just like turn to his keyboard and like pull out i'm bo yo he do his i'm bo yeah. yo song and bo for show he had like a bunch of different random songs he did and um i i mean i loved his stuff when i was a teenager and i think his it just like his progression as an artist overall is kind of fascinating from going from this like sure. youtube star og youtube star to being he was the youngest comedian ever to have a special on comedy central um, he was on Comedy Central Presents at 18 years old. Um, yeah, that's wild. That's crazy. <laughs> that his first special, What, in 2013, he was 22 years old. His next special, he was only 25. I mean, 
he was incredibly young. I mean, even when he made eighth grade. I got to start working. Isn't that crazy? Dude, <laughs> when he was 26, 27, making eighth grade. I mean, yeah, he's, he's, and he has the joke, and I kind of wanted to break this thing down because it is an interesting, the whole project, that makes me sad that you said your friends didn't watch the whole thing because I, you need the whole thing. Yep, because it yep. has this, he, he like, at the beginning tells you that this is going to be all over the place, that it's going to be, um very scattered and i don't really think it is structure wise i think if you take it at face value and you just like don't think about it you're like yeah this is all over the place but if you like think about the whole project i think he structured it in a very meaningful way um oh, if you i kind of break it I into think it's parts genius. how like you mentioned one of the biggest things that you see throughout the the project is he very intentionally never cuts his hair, his his hair and his beard. Sure. From I'm assuming the beginning of the pandemic until whenever he finished this, he just let it grow. So as he's working on this special, and you end up finding out he spent over a year just filming, um, right? Because he just it looks like he just every day went into his guest house and yeah, there is a funny moment around. where he's like he's like my beard is longer now, and I'm like, is it? I, I mean, yeah, tell. the uh, <laughs> the the reaction video, the reacting to the reacting to the reacting yeah. video. But I think he does that intentionally to help visually structure the video so you can kind of see where he's at from in terms of a headspace. Because I think early on in the video, he does. You mentioned there's like some things, some visual cues. He kind of pulls like a fight club. You ever seen Fight Club? Yeah. How sure, Fight Club, <laughs> Tyler, Tyler Durden talks about splicing in pornographic images into movies and kids' movies, like just a frame to mess with kids right. and families. Right. He, he does that with like images of himself later in the special, like of mm -hmm. his beard and his long hair and looking depressed. He even does it early on with his like Twitch streamer channel parody video. Down in the yeah, right corner, yeah. there's a quick flash of him being like a Twitch parody. And I... I think it's really fascinating how he, he like, it's like he's trying to cue you in onto like where this is going to go, that it's not a typical special and it almost gets very surreal. It gets very meta. And by the end, yeah. the ending's super like, I don't know if I call it absurdism, but it's very, it's definitely surrealism. The ending is super yeah. bizarre. Well, it's um, very, yeah. It's like, it's like very like, uh, I, I love when he goes outside <laughs> Yeah, that whole because ending. I'm just like, what are what where like, what? It's like he's still on a stage. It's like he's he's left the guest house, but he's stuck on a stage, and then he's watching himself do this. He puts yeah. it like through so many layers of like irony and like it's it's just such a bizarre watch. I mean, it's just a very fascinating experience. Yeah, yeah, I um there there were a ton of things i like especially when he starts breaking down you know three quarters of the way through the special um it starts really because i used i really watched this time to pay attention at what point they're in the first half the first 40 minutes there are glimpses of him like suffering from depression but it's like sure. usually again it's layered through so many there's so many layers of irony or like his for almost forced comedy like he's trying to hide it it's the i'm turning 30 sequence that right. like really after that it's just a downhill spiral and there's less and less complete bits after that sure, i think the sure. only com like fleshed out bits after that is the welcome to the internet and um the that funny feeling but that funny feeling mm -hmm. is all about like depression and anxiety i think and then the final song that's it everything in between is like like him either lamenting or commenting on his mental state or being frustrated yeah. there's the one scene where he throws down his equipment like it's it's right that, yeah I'm that one i couldn't 30. tell if he was being serious in the beginning where he's like yeah. he's like yeah i've been shooting this for a year but i think he hits on the nose every part of and i think that's what he's such a genius at he's he's so good at like hitting specific things like in eighth grade just like hits that kind of age perfectly yeah and in this i think he hits the progression of the pandemic for like 90 percent of people oh absolutely which was like 
oh, it's really fun, really fun. Okay, I have a bad day, but it's still really fun, really fun. And then it's yeah. like all of a sudden really, really quick spiral. And then it's like, oh, I've been doing this for a year <laughs> and I got to look forward to like what? And then as you get to the end, you're like, oh, shoot, things are opening back up. And uh, whew, I don't know what to do anymore. So, yeah, um, do I go outside <laughs> like so I can go back outside now? Yeah, I right. think that kind of that like social commentary if you can call it that or like i guess it's a meta i guess more metaphorical or symbolic of everyone's experience and i don't even, whether he really intended it or it just naturally came out because literally he was going through what everyone else was and even leading sure. up to the pandemic he was already dealing with you know some of his own you know, inner demons that he was, he had calmed down a bit. And I'm sure this spiraled it back out of control again for him. Um, and I'm sure that happened with a lot of people. I'm sure lots of people, you know, maybe we're in a good place and then this happened and it, it, you know, tipped people over. And there's a really chilling moment where he's talking about, um, it's right after the I'm 30, which the I'm 30 song. Mm -hmm. So are you 25? 25. So I, I turned 29 later this year and I'll, then I'll be 30 next fall. And that's been, I, I that sequence connects with me so much because he's only two years older than me. And so like right. that has also been in my mind and looming on me, like turning 30. And I know it, it's too, because it's just a number, like age doesn't really in the big scheme of things mean anything, but there's something about like, you're no longer a kid, no longer a teenager. And even like your twenties are great. Like, I don't know. I've enjoyed my twenties, but then there's yeah. something about like, 30 that it's just like it seems to be it's so morbid but like the beginning of the end i don't know like you're no longer yeah. a kid <laughs> you're not a teenager you're not an adolescent or like a you know stupid 20 year old like that's over like 30 you're getting like, close boom. to being like halfway done it that's it, yeah or at least a third for most people probably yeah. more than a third for most people and so yeah. it, it's just a very and, you know, I'm sure people in their 40s and 50s would roll their eyes and say, oh, wait till you're 40. Wait till you're 50. I've had yeah. people literally say that to me, but it's like, I don't know. I feel like it's okay, something boomer. that everyone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love his joke about boomers in this. Uh, he jokes about boomers a couple of times, but I, I just feel like there is something about that whole sequence that just it resonates with me um, on a personal mm -hmm. level. And then it's right after that that song ends with him saying i'll do another 10 and 20 or what does he say um in 2030 i'll be 40 i'll do another 10 and then i'll kill myself that or something i don't know i'm getting <laughs> yeah. the lines mixed up but he says he's gonna kill yeah, him. sure basically he says he's gonna kill himself when he turns 40 and then the song just like ends yeah it's super it's super dark it just ends and then the very next scene is him talking in the mirror saying that he's not going to kill himself. Like, just like telling right, me, right. like, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to kill myself. Um, and then he puts that through like this lens of irony by then projecting himself talking about that on an older version of himself who the yeah, hair yeah. is visibly longer. It's super chilling because it's like, you can tell he's months removed from recording that little like monologue about suicide. Right. And he's clearly more disheveled, like, more disturbed, more upset, more depressed. He's even the the further irony is he's on his phone. He he addresses in the special many times, you know, the downfalls of people being on their phone and like right. He even says at one point it's super meta, breaks the fourth wall. Are you watching this on your phone? And he's yeah, sitting yeah, yeah. there with his legs crossed, barely paying attention, like checking his phone and kind of I don't know, it's just it's a that whole moment is like I don't know. It's just like this whole special just that to me like is it's like the whole special like it's it's like it's it's most I'm trying to think most like raw or open in like the very core to me of the whole thing is like that whole 15 minute stretch from the time he like has the midnight show up on the clock right right starts which I thought he was gonna have on there for at least five minutes but you oh know, you're gonna it was, let it, it was, really go <laughs> out yeah yeah and i was i was like is it just not gonna turn is it not gonna and then it turned i don't know it was yeah that was uh i like that but that all the way through and then he follows it up pretty quickly with um that there's some things in between but then i mean it gets even more depressing when he goes to the song that funny feeling and then the all eyes on me obviously is his like reflection on his mental health leading up to the pandemic and right, like right. this, 
he he explored if you ever get a chance to watch watch make happy which you should it, it's really good it's on it's on netflix but in that special he also um explores his relationship with his audience like his the idea of him like being a celebrity and like a content creator he jokes about that a lot in the special yeah. um and like this insatiable like need like that he feels he's got to fulfill an audience's need like for him yeah, to be right. putting putting stuff out there like if he doesn't he's letting people down and like that just sure. adds to like the his deterioration of his mental health i think that all eyes on me thing that whole sequence i it is definitely a commentary on that and it's kind of continued from his previous special um but i think in retrospect if you do get a chance to watch the other two specials it's fascinating because i i just re-watched them a few weeks ago before i watched this one i hadn't seen them sure. since college i mean i was in college when they came out it's been a while um his growth as a comedian um it's i wouldn't say he was immature but i mean at 22 years old i mean as smart as brilliant as he is there was some things at 22 i mean he often used the f slur the homophobic slur in sure. one of his specials i mean for a joke and he would just say some things that i mean he even acknowledges there's a bit right. in the beginning where he's talking about yep. i'm problematic um because you know when he was younger and even on the youtube days he would make like misogynistic and homophobic jokes and you know they're jokes but i think it sounds like he's reflecting now that he's 30 years old kind of back on some of his old stuff and um i don't know i i, I just think there's a lot this special has a lot to offer and then on top of it the the title you know there's kind of a pun there it's like the whole special seems like it's literally he's inside a room but like i've read people have been taking this as a metaphor for like your mind like it's all sure. cluttered all the time and scattered and all over the place because your mind kind of just goes all over the place too. Yeah, no, I thought it was, I thought it was very interesting. The, um, the progression of just stuff that he had and like in the amount of equipment that started yeah. to show up in the rooms. And then also the amount of trash that yes. starts showing up like mass and whatnot. And it just keeps, Clothes more and more and more and then i think they kind of break away from it after he has his breakdown and throws his stuff and walks off camera um and turns the camera off but i thought that was like super interesting because i don't know if that was a purposeful choice or, yeah. or whatnot but i mean it like was totally you know uh, the pandemic you know yeah. and and like you watch that and he's like playing around with the little light as it's twisting around and you know he's on his little dmx board yeah. and whatnot and and i'm like man if that wasn't just like me with stuff that i was like yeah i guess i have a week off i'm gonna okay i'll go try and get creative oh so, yeah yeah right because it's so. that it's that other thing that a lot of people went through in the pandemic where like i remember one of the early stages of the pandemic like the first three to six months um especially the first three months where people were like, oh, I'm going to use all this time off to learn how to cook this or that. I'm going to learn a new language. I'm going to pick up a new skill or a new hobby. Sure. Um, you know, do something creative or, or take this time to learn something. And I feel like this kind of reflects that too in that it is so scattered. It's like he, there's some things that are fleshed out. There are some full songs, but it's like right. he, he wanted to play around with a little bit of everything. And I feel like that's so symbolic of, just that progression that people went through uh in general like i don't know there was yeah. there was times where i thought i was going to get some things done and i i don't know most people felt like they had all this time in the world and then spent a lot of time doing a lot of nothing <laughs> right and then it's like that breaking point where it's like i've had an entire year off and have not done anything not you know much. except yeah. for drunk drunk zoom calls and yeah. uh you know like like happy hour became a thing happy hour became like, a daily thing and yeah, and it's then Tuesday, uh, what are we drinking tequila exactly Great. yeah <laughs> i know that was a that was an early stretch for my wife and i too was like we got into a bad i at one point it was like a month i was like okay i, I would have it wasn't like i was getting drunk every day but like we would right, have like right. a few drinks every day and then on the weekend we'd have more but then it was like a month right. went by. i was like i 
think I've drank every day for like a month. I ain't gonna stop doing this. Yeah, I feel like yeah. a lot even of if people, it's not that much, you like yeah, you're like uh, you're like okay. I gotta I gotta like purge a little bit here. I can't keep doing this. But and then you'd see people like oh, I'm gonna use this time to work out and get in shape. And I love how he has the, sure. the I'm problematic video. He's like doing exercise and working out and that. Yeah, and yeah. I don't know if that's in, supposed to be an intentional commentary on that or not, but I thought that. I'm sure it all is because it like the beginning of it for me was very funny because like I had to consciously tell myself like this was at the beginning of the pandemic. So like this is also like George Floyd time, you know, and, and George Floyd dying and and so many things that were going on and all the protests that were going on and and you have to tell yourself like oh this was in the middle of all of that and it, it's not him looking back on everything it's like no him yeah in real time recording this stuff um and that's what you know kind of like got me through that first like 10 minutes because i was like is this just gonna be one long youtube video that you know and it, it's not anything like that it, yeah. it's just so good well, and I, it's interesting that you say that because it makes you think how much footage he actually has. Because if he spent more than a year working on it, he released it at the end of May. You know, the pandemic started in March. So that means he probably worked on this. He announced, I think, in April. So mm -hmm. he probably finished and started i think he started post-production though while he was working on it because there's lots of sure that, that's where the like the almost documentary aspect of this comes in is there's plenty of scenes like sprinkled throughout where he's watching himself watching his like recordings like on his computer there's a camera right. like way off in the room he's on the computer you can hear us a, a bit that we just saw and it's like he was i think editing it and working on it as he was doing it so I, right. I'd be curious to know how much post-production work he even had if he basically was constantly recording and just sifted through the things he liked and kind of just pieced it together and had like a general template, a rough cut of the whole thing sure. by the time, you know, eight, end of March, April rolled around. Because I think, um, I'm trying to remember when he, April 28th, April 28th was when he posted on Twitter and Instagram um, a, a, that small trailer. So he worked on, he probably, I mean, there's points in the, in the special where he says it's been a year. So he was obviously right. still filming in March and, yeah. and it must've been yeah, somewhere I, I just, in April that he finally finished the, the, you know, cutting it all and, and editing it. Right. I, I want to know, I want to know when he went to Netflix and was like, Hey, I've got this idea for this thing, whether it was like towards the beginning of it, or he was like, there's no way they're going to buy this yeah. unless I have a fleshed out, like version of what this is going to be um because i've been in some of those rooms and they're i like i can't even imagine him pitching it without having anything like filmed yet you know or just a few things filmed the only thing that would make sense to me is because his last two specials were on netflix maybe he has some sort of a deal for so many mm. specials i know comedians tend to sign like dave Chappelle. obviously is the most high profile where he signed like a right. six special deal and you know it doesn't necessarily have to be a traditional you're in an auditorium or you know theater packed house tour you know mm -hmm. and so maybe he told netflix before the pandemic that he wanted to work on a new special and then the pandemic hit and then he's like i'm gonna have a new special but it's gonna be very non-traditional and netflix is i love netflix because they do you know put a lot of money throw a lot of money at at um you know, non-traditional things and giving artists like sure. artistic freedom. Um, so I think it's really interesting that they allowed him to do this. And I, I think they're going to win in a big way because this has gotten a ton of, ton of hits. I mean, this thing has yeah. blown up on social media and YouTube. He's posted right. three, three of the videos, uh, three songs as like music video clips to his personal YouTube account that last I checked, they all had over 4 million views. One of them is 17 million. Oh, nice. The welcome to the yeah. internet video has 17 million views. So, I mean, Netflix, I'm sure will get a lot of people watching this. I've watched it like five times. So yeah, I need to <laughs> I, do, I, I need to do another uh, rewatch of it. Cause like, I, I feel like there's so many little things that happen throughout this whole thing yeah. that are very intentional. Oh, yeah. um, you know, so I definitely need to do a rewatch of it. Cause like you said, it's not that long. No, um, it's very short. So it's, it's less it's than 90 minutes. It's an easy yeah. watch. It is yeah. a very easy watch. And it's 
it's one that I have found I've been rewarded on rewatches because you're right. Like that first time watching it, I didn't read a lot on it. I just knew he had a new special and I knew that it was all in his house and he did it all himself. Um, right. But I wasn't really, and I didn't read, I intentionally didn't like read reviews or anything on it. Um, Cause I didn't watch it the first week and it came out. I watched it like a, a couple weeks after it came out. And uh, after having seen his previous two specials, I, I, the, the initial beginning, cause if you watch other specials, it is kind of like his older stuff where he does a combination of like music and like stand up bits. There's not as many like stand up bits, right, right, in this one. Um, but he'll go like from the self deprecating humor to like the parody and satire. Um, but this one, I could tell right away, early on, that it was that it was going to be more of a reflection on mental health and depression in the pandemic. Um, and then sure. obviously when the I'm the I'm turning 30 thing hit, I'm like, oh, yeah, shit, this is like existential yeah. dread, existential crisis. Sure. Like, I mean, and that's why I've again, that whole sequence, once that hit like that has just like connected with me. And I've I've just, you know, I mean, there's a few moments that I almost have cried each time I've watched this. Like when he starts crying, like I think that's genuine when he at near the end when he's like, I am oh, not for sure. OK. For sure. Or like the song that he does that he plays for comedy that's so not funny. It's like, dude, are you okay? When he's like, I'm feeling like a big bag of shit. Like it's like yeah. kind of funny, but you're like, he's not okay. Like he is not good. Right. I mean, even in the right. beginning when he introduces this, he says, I've been doing this so I don't put a gun to my head and put a bullet in my head or whatever he says. Like that's one of the very opening moments of this special. Right. I mean, that I think was what really tipped me off. I'm like, oh shit, this is like, this isn't going to be that yeah, funny, this is, is this it? this could get intense. <laughs> and there are some moments where I laugh pretty good. I mean, the welcome to the internet kills me. Uh, right. the, se- the sexting one, the sexting yeah. video is yeah. hilarious. Especially the vision. Dancing, in, dancing yeah. in front of, uh, oh yeah. I just <laughs> With the projected words and the emojis and right. everything. It's just. I love the ending when he's like on the computer, like, yep, okay. Um, yeah. And like sexting is on there and he like walks over to it. And I was just, I was like, man, this is so good because it is like totally. Oh man. I don't know. It's that so was just... funny. Like that is some of the, and those are in the first half though. I mean. There's not really much. The Welcome to the Internet videos in the second half. That's probably about the only thing I think I laughed at in the second half. Second half yeah. is like, it's like, damn, this isn't. This is sad. Like you're really, you're feeling for him. Like it feels very right, genuine. Right. It doesn't feel. But like But it also was like the. It was the closest to like where we are now. And so yeah. I'm like, I'm like, man, I feel that. You know, like as everybody's getting back into everything and whatnot. I was like, yeah. yeah I, definitely feel that especially for like creatives who have been you know in their houses for you know the past year especially with a ton of sets being shut down and whatnot it's like what do you even do and then as everything's coming out you're like okay um what's this gonna be like yeah it and i've i've been fortunate being a teacher in our district went back to in person in march so Mm -hmm. i i got to april may and june we went into mid-june our school went pretty late this actually was our first week of summer we went to june 18th we went super late um wow. so i got to be back in person so it was nice being you know there weren't very many students we had kids that i most of my students were still online but a few kids in the room so i got a little bit of a transition there so i and i i feel for him too because i felt like i went through a bit of a depression in november i i'm fortunate i get to coach football and the football season didn't didn't get completely canceled we lost the first weeks of the season three weeks of the season but you know our season ended in november but like that kept me pretty focused september october november but then i remember november the season ended our governor whitmer had another shutdown and i don't know from like and thanksgiving and christmas we didn't really do anything crazy because we were worried about sure you know no one was vaccinated we didn't want to get our grandparents sick or anything like that right yeah my wife stayed here yeah, well, my, like my wife was pregnant, so we really were trying to be careful of that. And we had also right. an almost one year old son, uh, so that's another thing. We had two kids in a pandemic. March and they had the same <laughs> birthday, March twentieth, March twentieth. Uh, Irish twins, so I don't recommend doing that. But um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. There was just a, a dark period. I felt like, at least for me, I don't know about other people, from like November to. I don't know, into January and then January, February, March, I was in my right where I am right here teaching 
um, every day. And I yeah. got so sick of just being at home all day. So I, I, right. I don't know. This special connected with me um, for that reason. I feel, and I like that it doesn't pander, and and it's not on the nose. Like he, like we mentioned already, he never says COVID, COVID nineteen. He never says pandemic. He never says a flu. He doesn't say anything about that. Right. It's literally just an exploration of like the human condition during this time. And it's so focused and contained. It doesn't really acknowledge everything else going on. Right. It's just right. a creative, this creative guy who's trying to deal with his own personal demons that he was already dealing with, coupled with the pandemic and trying to create content for his audience. And he just goes through these stages of just like despair. And we just kind of watch yeah um, his descent into i don't know if i'd use the word madness but like deeper, and deeper i mean uh, yeah a little bit because like the beginning of it does seem a lot like and I, he does reference it a few times um it does seem a lot like him in his bedroom the early youtube days where it's like okay i gotta figure this out and like I and there's literally this, a moment then... where he's watching one of his old videos yeah 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 yeah. <laughs> early, yeah i think it's very early on and, and for me, that was like, okay, like, and, and I had seen that with so many people out here that it was like the beginning was, okay, let's figure out how to be creative. Let's figure out how to keep things going and whatnot. And after like, you know, a couple of months, everybody was just really tired of the Zoom shows yeah. and everything else, you know, and, and I just like, I was like, oh man, I feel that. I yeah. feel that. Um, especially because, you know, we had talked about, he was getting close to like being able to start performing again yeah which means that he was definitely working a lot leading up to the pandemic he's probably prepping and then, he's probably doing a lot of prep right yeah so like just like with a football season ending you know like it's literally just nothing and you're like just over oh, it's just okay done. um yeah now, and, you're yeah like, and you're like now what and like you said like do? a lot of people are like oh I got all this time off i'm gonna be creative and, and like you said you can see that early on in the specials He's like, he does it at the beginning. They does it at the end. He shows you at himself at the beginning with short hair and then again, long hair right. playing around with all this different stuff. And I feel like at the, the end, the disco ball with the light is so like one of cool. my favorite things. Like he, he does that. So and I was cool. like, Whoa. <laughs> or when he's doing the I'm 30 and he has that backlight, he's holding against his back and he shines it sure. around himself. Yeah. 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 He does so many, like the fact that he did this whole thing in, in his guest house, which is like a two room, it's literally like a living room and a kitchen. Like, yeah, he accomplishes so much visually. We didn't even talk about that yet, really. With I, the I'd love to know how many takes he did of like everything, like just trying to figure out, like you said, how much yeah. footage he has. He and, has to have you know, so much extra footage. But again, if he every time he did like a bit, <laughs> maybe if he like took what he liked you know, and cut it over into like a software program and just was putting the footage that he liked. It probably helped him through the process to kind of keep sure. it focused, I would imagine. But yeah, like something like the white girl's Instagram, white woman's Instagram, that yeah. must have taken weeks. I mean, I the just, production I can't even imagine the production design. I mean, he buys all these props and costumes and does the make like all the production of all of that, the scenery and the, the right. lighting and the the camera work i mean <laughs> it's all uh it's all what we all did which is uh amazon purchases yeah because um, exactly. a big thing for us during the pandemic was a lot of prop houses either were shut down or were you know you had to schedule at least a day in advance to get in and you know we're used to shopping two days before yep. and tagging stuff and then picking up a couple days later and for us, it was, it just like immediately went to, okay, we need to like order everything on Amazon yep. um, to get it here in time, to get it cheaper. Like, you know, it was, it was a very, very interesting um, turn of events for us Oh yeah. Uh, in terms of production. So I, I totally feel that. And like, I could just see him sitting on his computer being like, um, okay, what can I get from Amazon? What do I need to do? You know, like I he got just, creative with it though. He got very creative with it. I, I, again, he does, it's not like he had limitation on money. Uh, money obviously right. wasn't a factor. He's got nice, nice, the resources and the um, equipment that he has seems to all be right. pretty top, top of the line. I mean, his well, one of my and, favorite parts is when, is when the, the hazer goes off a couple of times as he's standing behind his equipment. He's like trying to get it to work. And 
I was like, that's a hundred percent one of those like party city hazers that like he just. Yep. But you know, he got it to work because most everything that's shot has haze in it. Yep. You know, especially because he's inside. So like, you know, you see all those lights coming in and whatnot. And I'm like, man, the amount of work that that guy put into these videos with, you know, I, even though he had money, limited resources, um, because but, he wasn't all by shooting himself. any of I his think specials. Being right. all by himself yeah. is, is the key thing. Like no help. And there's there's a there's a point to maybe a couple times where he's like he's like looking in the camera like this, and you can tell he's like trying. He's looking at the LED screen, you know, like right next to the lens, and he's like trying to make sure he looks good. And then he like repositions, he, you know, and yeah. and I'm like man that is like so hard because i did some acting when i got out here and like if you're doing it by yourself you know and trying to do an audition you're like trying to make sure you look good while yeah. setting up the camera and I, <laughs> but on top I of just, it i mean he's 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 also doing music on top of all of that stuff. right right like that adds a whole other level like all of the music the lyrics and then he he takes the music and the lyrics and he coordinates the visuals like the camera work and the lighting and some of the stuff coordinates with the beats you know and, right, and some right. of the things that are being set like i love the welcome to the internet one um where he does obama's here to vaccinate your kids and he turns and yeah, the camera yeah. cuts and edits with every single turn like it's i don't he just there's so much visually that he puts into it like if you were to just read that it was all inside one room you're like oh that could be pretty boring it's never Right. Never. Been. No. I mean, not for one. Now second. there is one point where the camera turns and there is a guy holding a boom pole and I was looking oh, in the is? credits to see. Yeah. I Okay. Now, now don't quote me on this. I'll need to rewatch it, but there's like hands. Do you remember what I'm like, I want to say it was towards the beginning, maybe the first like 15 to 30 minutes. I'll have to, but it's, it's like they, and they're not his, you're sure they're not from, his hands. I'm pretty sure they pan from him being in front of the kitchen back to the room and is there's it not the like, mirror though there's a mirror that's where he films himself talking a couple times it's not the mirror and then well maybe of maybe mirror. it could have been i'll i'll have to i'll have to rewatch and if i can get a screen okay. grab of it i uh, we'll i'll text, send it to you, you. Have to text it to me yeah. <laughs> i was gonna say because i i i would be surprised because i feel like I don't know. I would be surprised. Maybe if you it find... was something in the mirror and it just like reflected perfectly to where I was like, is that somebody's hand? But it cuts so quick that I'm like, wait a second, was that somebody's hand in yeah. there? Because I was like, I thought he was alone. But I mean, even if you only had one person like I... helping you out, like yeah. that's pretty amazing. Well, and I, I watched the credits. I mean, I don't think anyone was credited with any of the technical aspects other than him. Right, yeah, and I watched very specifically to see if anybody was credited. Um, so maybe that was just a gap on my part, okay. and uh, I need if to you, rewatch. If you rewatch it and you find that moment, whether oh, you know, I'm going to rewatch it yeah. tonight now because I'm like, oh shoot, I, yeah, golly, I don't want to sound like a loser being like, oh, there was another person, and everybody's like, dude, this guy's an asshole. <laughs> yeah, I was, I, oh, I, I'm gonna, have to, I'm gonna have to see because I, I think I don't know. I remember seeing anything like that. I feel like I remember seeing his hands on on it at one point, but I don't know. You'll have to you you take you look and then you you tell me. But um, right, well, there was so much going on that I, it could have just been like I was like, what is going? And then you know it was a pan and it was, was his quick. hands, and I was like, wait, was that hands? And I was like, ha ha. <laughs> and then there's so much going oh, on. We're like, oh, I gotta get back in. I gotta watch everything that's going on. Right. Yeah, I know. I like turned away for one second, and all of a sudden he's in another bit, and I'm like, "Oh shoot, what did I miss?" Um, it's and that's uh, another thing is the pacing of this. Again, it's less than ninety minutes, but I mean, nothing ever lags or drags or gets. I mean, it's no, no. Even the more somber moments, to me, he has they're they're visually interesting, or you're invested in terms of his progression and and what's happening with him. At least me personally, I. I always found myself invested, even some of the more somber, quiet, you know, moments where sure. he's kind of just talking. Um, like there's a moment that's very short where he's on a blanket and a pillow in the middle of the floor with all of this equipment around him. And he's talking about right. so social media. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, it's literally like a, a 60 second thing. Um, like even things like that. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I think everything about it is great. Um, 
I think everything, like you said, seems very intentional. And uh, I'll probably end up watching it again. Um, I don't know. Are you a letterbox guy? Do you use letterboxed? Letterbox? No. You don't know what letterbox I, I, is? I, I know of it, oh, but okay. don't use it. Okay. I, um, I, I, so I do all my movie rankings on there. I have for, I discovered letterbox in 2016 when I was in, when I was doing my study abroad, I, I discovered it. And uh, yeah, for five years, I've done my movie list on there. I have, I have this one on my movie list. Um, it's pretty high. I think I got it like my, I've 20 something movies I've seen 2021. I think I have this at like four and again, it's not a movie, but I think this yeah. project in, in terms of it's the way you can talk about it and analyze it and, and the visuals and everything he puts into it. I think it can go up there with, you know, some of the best movies that come out this year, you know, sure, I, sure. I don't know in terms of, you know, themes. Who are your, and, what are your movies above, uh, above this special um i loved minari i think i have minari above it um i loved i loved Zack snyder's justice league i hated uh-huh. the joss whedon one i really really like this one it's i think my number one right now um something's between minari and this i'm trying to remember what it is now i'm gonna have to look it up i think i have letterbox yeah I, do. I got letterbox right here what do i have Oh, Judas and the Black Messiah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then no, nobody, Bob Odenkirk's new action movie. I have it number five right after that. I really like that one. I haven't seen a lot of stuff yet this year. I've, I've got, oh, I got 29 well, things on here, I guess now. It's also kind of tough because like you were watching some movies that technically were 2020. Yeah. Like Judas and the Black Messiah, technically a 2020. I, I have know. it on my 2021 list, but like there were, um, there were all those movies that came out in March, February, January, February, March, or like were released only in festivals last year. Right. That I'm not counting for 2020. Like The Father, um, I've been really wanting to watch with Anthony Hopkins. That was now my best right. picture. Excuse me, but the only way it was available before the end of the year was in screeners and maybe it was in a few festivals. Um, it didn't receive yeah. a theatrical release or a VOD release until after the New Year. So I'm. It'll right, be on my right. 2021 list. So those are sure, those sure. are my standards. That's kind of how I keep it in terms of doing my list. But yeah, man, I, I love this project and uh, I'll probably I'll probably watch it like a sixth time, I'm sure, at some point. I've watched I'll definitely get times. at least a second watch in, probably a third, just because I feel like the amount of things that I will pick up on on every watch was just immense. I just keep wanting to rewatch it. I don't know. I, I and I keep telling people to check it out and um I think it's not something I would recommend for everybody. Um, right. I think if you're not into Bo Burnham, you're not into like something this retrospect, you know, this this reflective or like deep, you know, in terms of emotionally and, and getting into like depression um, and anxiety right, right. and things like that. Um, or even someone who really is into visuals, those kinds of things would probably appreciate it. But um yeah i will say yeah there are parts in this special that are a little bit crunchy that like you know you have to get through and only only in looking back on it you know do you really put the pieces together um but especially on a first watch yeah there are just like some spots that you're like whoa okay you know like i've said before where he's just like he's like yeah i've been doing this for a year and then he stops and he repeats and i'm like is this a bit and then, like, you hear it in his voice, and he's just like, I have been do." And then he just he just throws it, and I'm like, I'm like, ooh, yeah. I like, think everything, like- everything emotional to me seems genuine in this. I don't, I, yeah. To me, yeah. it never feels false. Um, and well, that's, and that was that's like, why it that feels was kind so of the genius too. of it. Yeah. Yeah. Because, like, you don't watch a Bo Burnham thing and expect that he's going to be super serious. A good yeah, amount of the time. He always puts, like I said a couple times, he always puts everything through these layers of irony, these multiple like levels of irony. I mean, he does it literally with the React video. Like he yeah. he makes this really goofy kind of social commentary song on like capitalism and right, then right. does a reaction to it. He's also parodying YouTubers, does a reaction to it. Then he reacts to himself reacting and like criticizes his reaction. 
Then yeah, he does yeah. another reaction, <laughs> criticizing his reaction, criticizing his reaction. And so it's like, but by the, there's so many layers on it. By the end, he, he ends up saying, like, I have this, this defense mechanism of trying to criticize myself before people criticize me. And that layer was like, he was trying to admit that he was pretentious. The video doesn't really mean anything. Yeah. So it's like he, he, he filters everything through these so many different layers that and he, if you watch his other two, what and make happy what again, he's like 22 years old. So I don't feel like it's at, uh, with a 22 year old. I feel like everything's sarcastic and ironic. That's just how like sure. 19, 20, 21 year olds are. I mean, even teenagers in general are just so sarcastic and ironic but right right he's 30 you know what i mean and he openly discusses that and i feel like this is super personal i feel like he's him he is removed and he's gone through kind of some some personal demons that have kind of removed him from that former self that former stage persona but if you watch make happy there he does get into some of that stuff a little bit and make happy He's got a final yeah. bit in that one that really heavily addresses the audience performer relationship. Um, and he puts it through, um, he recycles it through Kanye West. Um, I won't spoil it if you haven't seen it, but you should definitely watch Make Happy as well. I think yeah. um, that might be a good one to watch right after this one because there are some links in there in terms of similar style. Um, but yeah, he's. He's always been a very interesting person, an interesting artist to me, and he doesn't do that much. If you look at his body yeah. of work, I mean, everything he does, I think, is really great, but he hasn't really, mm -hmm. in the grand scheme of things, done that much. But he's also only 30. Like, right, he got started right. on Still YouTube when he was 16 yeah. years old. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. Well, that's like, you know, we, we work with a lot of TikTokers and, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's really interesting because a lot of these kids are 16, 17, 18, 19, and they're just getting handed gobs of money. And I just think about Bo being that young and, and the internet being, so, not the internet, but YouTube being so new and. Cause he was like, really pre-social really media too. Yeah. Right. Um, so like all of that really interests me because now there's barriers and whatnot that like these platforms really try and cultivate like young talent where I feel like YouTube was kind of like an, un you know, what do we do from here? I don't know. Can we try to do this, but there were no safeguards in place. You know, I think we saw like, that a lot with a lot like of a miners and stuff. Yeah. Um, I think that there's like, well, one, there's a lot of money now to be made and all of that um, advertisements so, ad revenue is yeah. crazy yeah shoot i mean the machine gun kelly video um or the the movie that we did um little huddy has something like 20 million followers on instagram and I'm, I'm just like that's so wild like you know this like 17 18 year old kid with 20 million followers I don't, it's just it's so funny and they became famous less than a year ago you know um, you, which you wonder is what that kind of does to their mental health, like especially at such yeah. a young age. You wonder how that affects people. Right, right, yeah, and I, I don't know. Um, they've all been great to work with, so I, you know, have no complaints uh, with them. But yeah, I do, I do think I'm like, man, you, y'all jumped from zero to a hundred real quick. Yeah, that's a you dream know? very quickly. So, and with no in person anything. That, yeah, um, that's another so, phenom that's another phenomenon that's coming i mean i guess bo burnham technically blew up without anything in person i mean he blew up with right, youtube videos right. so yeah. that, i guess that's not really a new phenomenon but i don't know it's uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff to talk about i mean we didn't even really get into the fact that he he does kind of also really get into the internet as a whole and i think that's another element to this special is the effect that internet and social media and youtube as a whole over his life um how maybe that has brought him to where he is now it, de it definitely has sure you know it absolutely yeah. has i mean it's very very interesting yeah well you know we will we'll have to table another discussion on youtube and well, I just want to see where TikTok is going to go. I feel yeah, like it has a pretty so strong new. hold. Yeah, you know, it's so new. But we'll see. Um, I don't know. It's uh, it's going to be interesting. Um, the next 
like year or so seeing how we all come out of everything and, and yeah. where we go absolutely so well, all right, man. I, we've been talking for a while, and I don't want to keep you too much longer. <laughs> here. Do you have any closing thoughts or any other things you want to add on Bo Burnham or the special? Otherwise, we can wrap things up. Man, I, I need to I need to do a rewatch, and then and then next time we talk, we'll 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 talk about a second, third watch, uh, and, and see if anything changes for me. Absolutely, I'd love I'd love to have you back on, man. To talk about do you like how i just invited myself back onto the show (laughs) i i want you back on i want to talk about more movies and stuff absolutely you're more than welcome back on i i had a lot of fun this is a great discussion and uh, i was looking forward to talking about it i i thought it was uh thought it was a great discussion and i appreciate you taking time out of your uh your busy schedule uh she's a pizza i've had you for almost two hours here from the time we started pre-recording so i appreciate you uh, it's been a pleasure anytime i can talk about uh movies or anything is uh anything visual any visual oh it's so fun (laughs) yeah yep well all right man uh thanks for coming on andrew before uh, we wrap things up I think I asked you earlier. I don't remember. Do you have anything you want to plug or anything that you want to promote? Um, anything I want to plug or promote? Um, not at the moment. Um, I have some uh, new music videos coming out beginning Ooh. of July, um, which will be, they're definitely the biggest videos that I've designed. Um, so, so that'll be cool. So beginning of July, we'll look out for, for that stuff and I'll actually post them on my, uh, on my instagram <laughs> so next time i have you on then those will be those uh if i don't get with you before then if i get with you after those will be out and we'll definitely be promoting those for sure for sure well, all right andrew thanks for joining me if you're listening along hopefully you enjoyed our discussion on uh andrew's experience with film school and his job out in la and also our discussion on bo burnham's latest special inside uh, it's on Netflix. If you haven't watched it, got to check it out. It's not very long, and I know everyone has Netflix, so no excuse <laughs> no excuse not to find just over 80 minutes to, to watch it at some point. Uh, we'll be back very soon uh, with another episode talking about There Will Be Blood with a few friends of mine. Uh, none of them had seen it, so they're all first-time watchers. We're going to be talking wow. about that a little later this wow. week. Yeah, none of them that's had exciting. seen it. Sorry, that's uh, exciting. One of them I already know doesn't like it, and I don't know if I can be friends with him anymore because it's one of my favorite movies. But he's not as big a movie guy. But um, sure, sure. so that that will be uh, coming very soon. And uh, again, hopefully have Andrew on another time uh, this summer. And uh, uh, I'm Vince, Andrew Johnson, Film Nerd Podcast. Thanks for listening. Go watch the movies.